Today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Point and shoot cameras are like reasons to live. We all want one, but only some of us have one. Terrible intros aside, automatic point and shoot cameras have gained a tremendous amount of popularity over the past few years, probably because I don't know. People want to do film photography without all the boring technical stuff. I don't know. I mean, we all see our favorite celebrities with these cameras and they look cool. They look hot and sexy. But, you know, we the consumers don't always want to spend, you know, celebrity prices for the exact same model to look hot, cool, and sexy. So oftentimes we'll look for, you know, more economical solutions. But sometimes those, I guess, cheaper alternative point shoots may come back to bite you in the ass, dick, balls, butt, gooch taint grundle or i don't know maybe all of the above so today i wanted to find out what the actual difference is between a cheap ass point and shoot like this this or this and a bougie ass point and shoot like this this or this and do you really need the more expensive one this study of poverty point and shoots i picked up this camera off of excedrinbay.com aptly named because you'll probably need one afterwards it's the olympus oz1 panorama weatherproof and i picked it up for about 50 dollars after it spent a little bit of time on my ebay save search profile alongside like a ton of porn for some reason anyway 50 dollars it might seem like a lot and it is a lot but not really comparatively. This camera actually goes by a few names depending on the market. It's also known as like the Olympus Infinity Mini and the AF1, I believe. I think the selling point of this thing is that it actually houses the same lens as its higher end big brother from the same mother, the Olympus MJU 35 millimeter 3.5 with a pretty good reputation. This time just in an overall cheaper body, I suppose. But what else has been downsized? Let's find out with the Olympus OZ-1 in hand and a $50 hole in my pocket that could have been, you know, $50 Rita's instead. Monica and I made our way down to San Diego for a series of meetups with the darkroom and beers and cameras, but we we're able to make a few stops along the way. Hola. You join us in the middle of a road trip down to San Diego, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about this inexpensive point shoot, which I'm gonna load up with some FPP retrochrome. We're here at our, uh, Alma Mater, Chapman University. Is Alma Mater the right word? You did uh, it. I don't know who Alma is and why she matters, but sure. Anyway, at lunch, I had struck gold, you know, after rushing to the bathroom for an emergency that we don't really need to get into. It was this like ornately decorated shitting room, for lack of a better term, that would bring a tear to even the most swashbuckling sailor's eyes. Naturally, I whipped out the OZ-1 and got to work after I, you know, put in work fighting for my life in there. And yeah, these photos, they suck fish ass, though, through no fault of the camera. Retrochrome is an expired slide film from Area 51, if you believe the lore, and it's been hand respooled for our shooting pleasure. It is a bit of a finicky film stock and kind of hard to get right at times, a, a bit of a difficult test for a cheap point shoot. In hindsight, a more capable film stock, like maybe a color negative film stock, would have been a better choice here, but whatever, f it, there's no going back now. I like to use flash for this one and no flash for this one. By default, the flash mode is on auto, but it can be turned off with a few you know, button mashes. This is pretty standard. However, when you turn the camera on and then off, it does forget everything and reverts back to auto flash. For whatever reason, remembering your settings from your last session is something that only the premium point shoots really seem to have. So if for some reason that's important to you, be prepared to either shell out or shut up. Ask me about my wiener. <laughs> Ask me about my wiener. fast forward down to San Diego. We were staying at the Lafayette, a very decorated and stylized hotel featuring a bar and like a 24 seven diner, which is kind of just wild to me. It literally becomes San Diego's hottest nightclub in the evening too. And in line with that, these ornate but tiny ass rooms had these like massive bars in them that took up like half the floor space for some reason. Super cool for all the alcoholics out there. Anyway, after staring at the all too familiar painting of a guy who's sitting on a toilet just out of frame and clearly struggling as evident by the fact he removed all his clothes, we had Headed out that evening for a beers and cameras event, and I shot this in route, which I quite like. Focusing through glass can be a tricky thing for many point shoots, so I'm glad this worked out well. 
Let's talk a little bit about why this camera here was only $50 when comparatively a lot of other cameras are much more. Starting with functionality. And I think this is gonna be one of the main points in this video. Foreshadowing aside, I picked up the OZ1 and encountered a problem pretty quickly that I didn't really realize until later. This camera does not seem to have exposure lock. Most of the diner was pretty heavily backlit and I wanted to expose for the interior, not the outside light. So I did the usual uh, you know, point and shoot thing where I pointed it at an area that I wanted to both expose and focus for and then I reframed for the photo that I actually wanted to take a shot of all while holding the uh, the shutter button down but as you can probably tell the camera disregarded my high concept artistic intentions and instead exposed for the backlighting anyway. Some of the higher end point shoots have this like button that adds about a stop and a half of exposure to compensate for backlighting but for $50 forget about it. You'd have better odds of betting on the Miami Dolphins winning the Quidditch World Series. Basically what I'm saying is you're not going to find many manual controls, if any at all, on the cheaper point shoots. If I was a half competent photographer, I would have used fill flash for these, but it didn't come to mind in the moment. And the camera didn't use it either because, I don't know, I guess it felt like there was enough light and you know what, I guess technically there was. Nonetheless, I did walk away with a banger of a photo shot through another window. <laughs> Anyway, at the photo walk in Balboa Park that day, Monica wanted to get in on some of the action as well and loaded up in Kodak Gold in another cheap point and shoot. Yeah! The Minolta Freedom Date USA Explorer Boston Tea Party Zoom or something like that. I don't know, it's got like 10 names. It's a camera that my mom used and then gave to me. but whatever, let's talk lenses on these bargain bin point shoots. I don't really think there's gonna be any quality issues whatsoever, to be honest. Most people aren't out here drum scanning or printing their shit, so I think whatever quality differences there are will be pretty nominal to the average user. To me, it always seemed like the lens technology was ahead of format, most of the time anyway. The lens on the OZ-1 is fine, there's no real complaints here, but there is some vignetting, and that's likely only noticeable on color positive film. I've definitely said it before, but that Minolta that Monica was using actually has some lens drip to it. It's surprisingly sharp and effective for being a super tiny zoom lens, even if it looks sexually suggestive oftentimes. And if we go back to the backlighting scenario from earlier, the Minolta seems to outsmart the backlighting quite well comparatively. And this camera only goes for like $20 on eBay. Sure, it's not the prettiest camera in the world, but that kind of leads me to my next point. But anyway, with nothing else to do on the last day, I grabbed my Olympus Ozempic 1 to finish off the roll around the hotel. And the shots are, I mean, whatever, who cares? Jason never likes his photos anyway. But ultimately, what I wanted to talk about with these two cameras is looks. Either the OZ-1 or the Minolta are standout performers in the cool or cute department, but they are capable of producing quality work, and I think that's the main difference here. Sadly, I think most of us are kind of vain and want to be seen with the coolest cameras, like their jewelry or something. I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I'm above it. I think most of the time, it probably just depends on what technical level you're shooting at. And at the end of the day, I think most of us are simple. We just want to take pretty photos that turn out and for fifty dollars that dream can be a reality oh and yeah for some reason all of these cheap point shoots have like the world's shittiest battery doors that fall off after like one use so just a heads up don't let that be a deterrent just grab some gaff tape and let it ride Anyway, before we hear some closing arguments and give this camera its lifetime sentence, I'd like to first thank today's sponsor, Squarespace, for their ongoing support. Let's not kid ourselves. You've probably heard of the industry-leading Squarespace before, but did you know that it features even more modern-day tools to help you build a photography portfolio in virtually no time at all? I've used Squarespace for several years now to host my own portfolio, and whenever I get the creative itch to redesign my page, it's easy as one, two, three, with tools like design intelligence that utilize groundbreaking artificial intelligence to not only perfect, but personalize your your new website down to every last detail. If you'd like to go a step further and sell products like prints of photographic work, you can now use AI to power things like product and video descriptions, as well as email campaigns. It's designed to take some of the load off when crafting your new website workspace to allocate other resources like time and critical thinking to other more important components of your online presence. And if you run into any snags, you can get in touch with Squarespace's award-winning 24-7 customer support or find the answer you need amongst the always available help pages. So what are you waiting for? If you're ready to build a website, you can start a free trial today 
at squarespace.com slash granny days. And if you use the code granny days at checkout, you can get 10% off your first purchase. So with all this bullshit behind us and the study concluded, if you can even call it that, I would conclude this video by saying that all the cheaper point shoots out there are good enough for 90% of the population shooting film. But it kind of ultimately boils down to two things, looks and functionality. We all know the $1,000 Contax T2 is hot. That's why everyone has one. But is the $50 Nikon Light Touch Zoom 120 ED hot? I don't know. It's up to you really if you care about a camera's sex appeal. It pretty much has no overall effect on the final images whatsoever, unless you're taking selfies in the mirror all day. At the end of the day no one's gonna know much less give a rat's furry ass what camera you shot what photos with so basically lie to people is what i'm saying functionality is much more important to a camera's continued usage and success if you're trying to do more advanced stuff with your work like push pull double expose shoot high iso film etc then you won't find features that allow you to do that on the cheaper models because they're dumbed down for general use. If you're just trying to power slam some musty ass drugstore film into your camera with reckless abandon to capture your epic summer memories in the sun, then great. Probably any point shoot will give you good enough results, provided it at least works. Just don't shoot expired slide film. It's a recipe for disaster most of the time. There are thousands of 35 millimeter point shoots all over the place nowadays. eBay itself is basically a Wally tech inspired wasteland of those things. You maybe just kind of have to lower your standards a little. It's kind of like dating, or I don't know, you can ask your parents if they have one somewhere. Chances are they probably do. And if you're a parent yourself watching this, remember to upsell the crap out of it so you can make a little bit of cash back off their freeloading ass. Also, also, please Please remember to rip out that half finished roll that's been sitting in the camera for all those years. Nobody wants to see whatever freaky shit you got up to with it.